If you feel like the loss of her father hasn't really impacted on Sefi yet, who admittedly has had quite the rough 24 hours, uh, then rest easy, dear listener. Issue 3 has got you covered. Sefi stands atop the roof of a particular tower in Canador, wearing a simple green sundress. Her hair is undone, her sigil is uncovered, and in her hands is a bundle of flower petals. On Meridian, when someone dies, they light a pyre and gather, Sefi narrates. They remember that person's life and stories, or thought, until they're ready to let them go, and they send their spirit to the stars when they scatter their ashes to the winds. Sefi doesn't have her father's ashes, so this isn't a proper farewell, but it'll have to do. As the body meets the wind, so does the soul take flight, she says. She holds out her cupped hands, and the petals are swept away into the wind. Sefi was alone in Catador with no news from Meridian. She didn't know if they had gathered to send her papa spirits aloft, or if he had been forgotten when Catador's soldiers invaded. So she did what she could. Goodbye, Papa, she says. Good journey. The handmaiden that we met back at the end of issue two, Isser, spots Sefi up on the tower, alone in her sadness with her thoughts, and screams in terror. With a resigned look on her face, Sefi looks down. It feels like she's gotten used to Isser's overreactions to her. Yes, Isser. Child, have you lost your mind? Come down from there at once. The minister has requested your presence right away. But we don't go visit Uncle Elon first. Instead, on Meridian, we travel to one of the lower levels of the island, where a single ship is soaring into a hidden port. So before we get into that, let's break down that opening scene. It is a short opening, but I really like the world building that author Barbara Kessel is doing here. Sefi having this little personal ceremony for her father is incredibly touching, and it helps to ground us in how quickly so much has happened to her. For us, as the audience in the world of We're Buying Comic Books, it has been three months since Meridian's story started, but for Sefi, it has been just over a day. Yesterday, her father was alive. Yesterday, she was on her island, and everything was great. Her father died. Regor tried to kill her. Her uncle saved her. She got this magic symbol on her forehead, and now she's living on an island where she's uncomfortable with her uncle that she's uncomfortable with, and her home island is being invaded by him. This sucks, and it has happened so quickly. Sefi doing this ritual that ties her back to her home island must feel so comforting to her. It allows her to acknowledge her grief and her loss, but it also lets her say goodbye to it, right? From the audience perspective, I think that this is great too, as it allows us to say goodbye to the loss of Turos, kind of as a plot point. Sefi's life is about to become a lot more complicated, and unfortunately we can't sit around feeling sorry for Turos forever. From a world-building perspective, I love this moment. I think that it is super important for the writer of a fantasy world to find ways to ground that fantasy world in reality, right? The audience has to believe that people live in whatever that world looks like, and that its society is built around whatever it looks like, and that those two things reflect each other. Society is informed by environment, environment is informed by society. It's a part of a cycle. And otherwise, why would you set a story on a fantasy world at all if you weren't going to take advantage of those fantasy world mechanics, right? Since all of the human life that we have seen happens on these floating islands, it makes complete sense that the dead bodies can't be buried underneath the ground, because there just isn't that much ground for them to be buried on. Rather than memorializing their dead, this forces the people of Meridian to share their pain with their friends, family, and neighbors, and then they say goodbye burn the body, and move on. Even sending their ashes to the stars makes a lot of sense to me, as human society has constantly been fascinated by the stars. And in a world where humans are even closer to the stars, right, because they're higher up in the sky, living on these floating islands, maybe traveling by the stars at night, in the same way ships would travel by stars here on Earth, 
the stars must seem that much more important to them. Believing that they send their dead to join the stars is a beautiful thought, and it's one that, to me, makes Meridian feel more realistic, more lived in. It gives everything a little bit more weight and depth. The opening page for this issue, with Sefi simply holding the flowers that represent her father's ashes, is simple, it's clean, and to be quite honest, it's beautiful. When CrossGen eventually began to release lithographs, their initial offerings were only two, one from Scion and one from Meridian. Scion's scene was Prince Ethan cradling the body of his brother, Artor, after his death in issue 6. Meridian's was this page of Sefi, and it was named Sefi Sadness, after one of the CrossGen message board members. I also like the moment between Sefi and Isser reinforcing what little we get to see about their relationship. It's very one note, but it's a perfectly executed one note. Uh, Sefi thinks that Isser is an overbearing, stuffy, pain in the butt, and Isser clearly thinks that Sefi is an impertinent, reckless flake. I especially appreciate that Isser is clearly terrified of how high up Sefi is, which I largely think is funny, because you live on a floating island, ma'am. You would think that she would be much more comfortable with heights, but clearly she isn't. Maybe rather than being more relaxed by her proximity to danger, Isser went the other way instead and got more terrified as she got older. Who knows? But Sefi is clearly not bothered by the heights, a motif that we have seen throughout the series so far. Sefi traveled across her island by a rooftop in issue one. Uh, she had a rope ladder hanging down from her room on Meridian, and even her room was set like on top of a small short tower. So again, she's used to heights. Uh, and she even fashioned her own escape rope on Catador last issue. Sefi feels at home in the sky, we're being told. And that's going to be important later on. Over on Meridian, we now see a little boy, dressed in a red coat with brown hair, rushing towards the edge of the land that he stands upon, excitedly waving. He also has on a leather bag strapped across his chest. Georgie waves at the ship that is approaching eagerly. He sees me! I'll show him where to find the secret cavern, Georgie says. Close behind him are Phoebe and Zuka, who warn him that it isn't safe. They aren't on the top of Meridian anymore, Phoebe says. There's no bottom rim to catch you, Zuka finishes. And sure enough, the soft soil beneath the child's feet gives way. Georgie drops, saved only by Phoebe diving for him and snatching the strap to his leather satchel. Keep very still, Georgie! Zuka grabs Phoebe's other arm and pulls. But it's not enough. They aren't going anywhere. On the approaching ship, Jed sees the trouble. He quickly grabs a spear gun and fires it into the dirt. In a flash, he slides down the rope, races over, and grabs Phoebe's hand just as it starts to tremble. Together, they pull Georgie back up. There, says Jed, we're all safe and sound. Phoebe thanks Jed for saving them, and he dismisses it easily. It was no big thing. Are you all right? he asks. And oh, yes, she is. And Phoebe closes her eyes, ready for a kiss from the hero. And Jad just looks away, totally oblivious. Where's Sefi? Wah, wah, wah. Jad spots Mira and stands up, going over to her instead. Unfortunately for her, Phoebe is left high and dry, and Zuka tries to distract her and Georgie by returning to the other kids that they're watching. Jed, meanwhile, touches base with Mira. His father, John, is still up top. It's not easy making a whole ship disappear, after all, she reports. But Mira does note the worried look on Jed's face. Why is he so upset? His escape went perfectly. Oh, and that rescue... He brushes off her concern, though. Oh, that was nothing. Do you think Sefi saw that rescue? Where, uh, you know, where is Sefi, actually? The pair stare deeper into the cavern, where we can see homes, docks, and several smaller ships. We don't know, Jed, Mira says. We think that she might have gone with Elan. Jed immediately starts to move, aiming for a ship. To Cadador? he says in shock. She would never! Mira, I have to get her back! He tries to rush off, but Mira grabs his sleeve, stopping him. 
We just freed you from Katadorian clutches, and now you want to rush back in? Jad pulls away. You can't tell me what to do. You're not my mother. Wow, okay, I didn't see that coming. That is some classic teen angst right there. Someone remind me to bring that up later down the road. 20 bucks I forget, though. Behind the pair, we see Phoebe and Zuka gathering the kids up. Georgie asks if the soldiers are going to get them like they got Sefi, and the girls reassure them all that that isn't going to happen. The grown-ups are packing things up and setting traps, and then they're all going to ride a ship. In fact, why don't they all play a game? They'll look for Sefi in their own way. But a little girl says that she can't play. She doesn't remember what Sefi looks like. Why did I give that little girl that accent? Phoebe says not to worry. Sefi has a mark on her head, right here, and she points at her forehead. Do you know the story? It appeared mysteriously. This talk of the sigil transitions us nicely to another sigil, Elan's. Once again, a nice, flooping transition! <sighs> With the kids fully enthralled, we return to Catador. Or we will in a minute. This is a relatively short scene in all of Meridian, but it has a couple of important moments that I want to take a moment to examine. First off, Jad continues to be cool as heck. It's no wonder that sephi has got a crush on this dude. He's good-looking, he's casually heroic, and as demonstrated here, he only has eyes for Sefi. The moment when Phoebe closes her eyes and prepares for Jad to kiss her, it is straight out of a romantic adventure story. Colorist Michael Adaye even switches things up here with this one panel getting a soft, warm, pink-colored background, where the ones before and after it are cool, masculine, dark blue. If we couldn't figure out what Phoebe was going for with her body language and face, then we sure as heck know what she was going for from the coloring, which I love. And it feels so realistic. I absolutely remember being the same way when I was younger, and not that much younger either. Um, before I met my wife, there were several situations where I had coworkers come up to me and be like, Hey Ben, did you know that blah blah blah's got a crush on you? And no, I didn't. I never picked up on it at all. Typically, if I wasn't interested in you, then I wasn't paying attention to whether you were giving me signals or not. And I just went about my business. So Jad not getting what Phoebe is doing here seems insane, right? What boy wouldn't recognize when a girl wants to kiss him? But God, does it hit with me. This feels right and makes a lot of sense. Uh, it is painful, but ooh. I would like to point out, though, uh, that nobody thanks Phoebe for her role in this action. And, like, she is the main reason that Georgie didn't just drop from Meridian like a sack of shrieking potatoes. Sure, she couldn't finish the job, and Jad had to help pull the kid up, but Phoebe is the one who caught him. Even Mira, when she was talking to Jad, was just like, Jad, you did such a great job saving Georgie, champ! Phoebe didn't help at all, just you! Jad, great guy, Jad! So forget Jad for just one second. I'm over here to say nice save, Phoebe. Good work. Way to pay attention. Fast reflexes. You nailed it. I'm sorry you didn't get your kiss, uh, even if Jad wouldn't have been down for it. Secondly, we also have a few important emotional beats when Jad is talking to Mira. Obviously, we have his crush reinforced when he both asks after Sefi and is willing to rush off to save her from her evil uncle. Like, Jad is a man who acts first without thinking. Like, when we just saw him save Georgie, there was no, oh wait, this is what's going on, should I do something? He just did it. And so far, this seems to work out for him. But Mira does have a great point, that it is dangerous, and he's young, and rushing off is pretty stupid. Mira is acting like his mom, but as Jed teenagerly points out, she isn't. This implies that it's just Jed and his father, John, so his own mom must have died at some point. Like Sefi's. Both of these kids lost their mothers at a young age, so it's no wonder that they became close friends. Both of their dads would have been busy working, both of these kids would have needed either someone else to look after them, or been left to their own devices. I can absolutely see the two of these kids running around the island, having imagination-based adventures while their dads are busy taking care of work and making sure that their lives are safe, right? 
We also learn that Jad's father, John, isn't just in charge of building ships. He is a member of Meridian's council, who I'm assuming would advise the minister. This helps to broaden the world of Meridian a little bit more, establishing that, at least on Meridian, the minister doesn't rule with an iron fist. They have a council that is made of its citizens, which I think is nice to know. It's not super helpful right now in our reading, but like I said, I do think it's good world building, and it helps make it feel more sympathetic. Obviously, this comic was going to be sold first to an American market before it was shipped to anywhere else overseas, and here in America, we like good old free will and self-determination, and so having an island that is ruled by a minister who is advised by counselors who are made up of citizens makes a lot of sense and feels right as opposed to going and looking at Katador, which is ruled by Elan, who is dictating policy and forcing the rest of the island to go along with whatever his will is. Katador is continuing to be villainized, while Meridian is continuing to be not utopia-ized, but made a more sympathetic state. It's meant to be something that we are familiar with and we're comfortable with, so we like them even more. While Sefi has been saying goodbye to her father, Elan has spent the entire night questioning the muse of Gaiatan, and he has gotten nowhere. Elan curses the short woman. He wants answers, information! And for the first time in this comic, Elan actually looks worn. His shirt collar is undone, his hair is disheveled. He's losing control of himself as he's trying to deal with this woman. But the muse is unaffected by his temper. The eyes of Gaiatan see many things. The eyes of the minister are clouded with need. Elan closes in on her. Yes, I need! I need to know if this ability is a function of my own nature, or is this ability duplicated in my niece? Unbeknownst to him, in his anger, the door behind him has opened. Sefi stands in it, wearing a beautiful blue dress with a matching neck piece. Her hair is gathered back in a tight bun, but she isn't wearing a headdress now. Her sigil is visible for all to see. Uncle Elan, she starts. They said he snaps around, shouting, Call yourself! You see the answer, the muse of Guy Tan replies, and yet you do not know it. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown, episode 32.4 of Meridian, Escape from Canador. First off, this scene with Sefi and Elon is short, but it does so much work for us. Elon's long night of questions with the Muse shows exactly how driven he is. This has been a facet of his character all along. After all, he poisoned his brother so that he could claim Meridian for his own. He is a man who pursues what he wants. But he's also really bad with social skills. The Muse says a few times that Sefi and Elan are related, sure, but she also says that they've got nothing in common as people. As such, they have nothing in common regarding the sigil as well. But Elan doesn't pick up on that at all. Meanwhile, Sefi either doesn't see her sigil as a weapon, which is a huge difference between the two characters, or she has accepted that it is a part of her in a way that Elan hasn't. She is okay with displaying her sigil, which is why she has her head covering off, and Elan isn't yet. He isn't even okay with her being okay with it. He is a control freak. She is a free spirit. This concept is even echoed in our opening scene, with Isser freaking out about Sefi's little tower hideaway funeral scene. She flaunts what they are afraid of, because she is fearless. Elan, however, is motivated by his fears. He hides his sigil. He assassinated his brother. He hides his true motivations for invading Meridian. Again, this is a masterclass in dramatic tension and contrasting characters from author Barbara Kessel. Just mwah, beautiful stuff. As we return to the story, we are now inside of a meeting hall. The room that we're in is darkly lit, with a massive wooden table resting in the center. 
A tapestry with the big old sea of Catador hangs behind Elan, who sits at the head of the table in a large, plush chair. Seated to his right is Sefi, in a new dress with a head covering. Bosco, Elan's major domo, is dressed in the purple robes of Catador, wearing a red tunic over top with that big C on it again. He announces the representative from Torbell, Solicitor Trupert. Elan sneers. So Rudy has sent his bulldog and didn't come himself. He gestures to Sefi. Watch closely. Minister Rudolf mistakenly believes himself to have the upper hand. This has led to him taking a dangerously relaxed approach to our negotiations. Solicitor Trubert then walks in. He is a middle-aged man with white hair and mutton chops. He wears simple clothes, a nice purple vest, a white long-sleeved shirt, leather gloves, boots, and brown pants. He does have on a prosthetic right leg, ornately shaped with wooden heel and toes and a knee joint. This is some nice metalwork for a world that doesn't seem that technologically advanced so far. Minister Alon, he says. Minister Rudif sends his greetings from Torbal. It's past time to renew our trade agreement. We didn't receive a courier from Catador to re-up, and since our supply is running low, I have been sent to finalize the deal. Wow, that is straight and to the point. I like that. Not even a lot of, like, sucking up. I like you, Trooper. Elon leans forward. There has been a problem. Torbell has cheated Catador. You have delivered Orvats that I know to be inferior to your latest production run. And Trooper is taken back by this. Cheated? There's no cheat here. We contacted you. We told you about the new vats, and you didn't want to pay more. So we supplied the contracted bats at the contracted price. Here, Elan steeples his fingers. Ah, but I've reviewed our contracts. It says that Canador will receive the finest ore vats available. You should have automatically shipped the better vats after they had been put into production. Trooper can't believe this. That, that language isn't in the body of the contract. This is a game of weasel words. Damn you, man! Your withholding of ore will put Torbal in jeopardy over a, a simple phrase? I'm not withholding ore, Elon replies. We have no current contract, and I don't make new business with those who don't keep their word. He waves the man away, telling Boscow to see him out. Trupert stutters. <laughs> Elon, do you know what you're doing? Torbal is massive. Without the ore to keep us aloft, the city will fall. Bosco places a hand on the man's arm. Minister Elon has concluded this meeting, sir. He leads him from the room. Sefi can't believe this either. When she watched her father work, neither side left the table until they were satisfied with the deal. He would never leave another city in danger. But then again, you know, Meridian just made ships. No one would die if you didn't sell them a ship. Maybe... That's just part of the business of Orr. Elon leans towards Sefi. Now, what did you learn? For the first time in this meeting, she looks up. That people should always make sure that they keep to the letter of an agreement, not just its intent. Her uncle holds up a finger. Ah, perception of intent. If it's not clearly outlined in the language of a contract, then it cannot be used as an excuse for non-performance. But... I heard... <laughs> Sefi fidgets with her dress below the table, clearly nervous to bring this up. I heard that a lot of people in Canador don't favor a hostile relationship with the other cities. Elon stares at her, unaware of her trip into Canador last episode. Where did you hear that? And Sefi suddenly remembers that he doesn't know about her trip. Oh, uh, around... She quickly switches to another subject. Would you really let Torbal fall? Only if necessary, Alon replies. Sometimes enforcement of negative consequences is necessary for the future of a business relationship. Or, in plain English, yes. The phrase, weasel words, is one that I have kept in my mind ever since first reading this issue. It's been 23 years, and it's still up there. I still think it. I feel like it is 
such a modern thing for Elon to be this pedantic about the wording of a contract, where it isn't just the words that are important, but the perceived meaning of their intent is what is important. It's frustrating, and I absolutely sympathize with Trubert's position here. It isn't like Torbel was trying to pull one over on Catador. They thought they did the right thing, they just didn't have the same meaning to the contract in mind. Elon is not legally in the wrong here, but he is an absolute no swearing asshole about it. This is the perfect example of what Sefi learned from her solo trip into the city. Elon is a great minister. This move is going to make him money. But he is a no swearing the person. We have now seen the theory that author Barbara Kessel introduced last episode put into practice with this episode. I do, however, have a light, and I'm talking light, appreciation for how Elon taught Sefi in this moment. Like, it's an absolute jerk of a lesson to teach her, but I did like him showing her a thing and then asking her what she took away from it. And to her credit, Sefi was listening and watching and paying attention like a good student should. She drew inferences from what she saw. My mind would have wandered off inside of like three seconds. I would have been imagining the X-Men fighting a Sentinel attack instead of this crap. To me, this single moment of Meridian is perhaps the closest that Elon comes to actually acting like an uncle who cares for her in this comic. He did say that he wanted her to be a great minister, and so he is teaching her how to be what he defines as a great minister. On Meridian, we see Jad's dad, John, lead a group of Meridianites to a cluster of woods. He directs them to an old hut where they'll find the next stop on their escape route. He can't leave yet. The minister staff and the council will be the last to go. He'll be along soon. One of the other people asks if he'll be okay, and John isn't worried. Those soldiers don't know the hills of Meridian like he does. And besides, he's got them outnumbered. There's only three of them. Hmm. <laughs> Hubris, thy name is John Tacardi, I see. Anyways, John hides behind a tree with a big ol' stick, and he waits for the Catadorian troopers to show up. When they do, he hits one of them in the face with a stick, and downs the other two with a single punch, each nicely handled. You're all just boys under those masks, he says. You wouldn't last a week on one of my ships. He admires his handiwork for a second, before being attacked from behind. A fresh squad of soldiers has arrived, and the biggest of them stands over John's unconscious body. Take him in. On Catador, we find Sefi standing in a hallway, admiring a stained glass window. The glass is shaped to look like vines and leaves, all of it colored in different shades of green. To me, the coloring is oddly disconcerting, as is the seasick green that it paints the scene in, but Sefi appreciates it. There was some good to come from Catador's business, she thought. Thanks to the island's abundance of wealth, it had become a benefactor of many artists. Despite everything that she missed back home, Sefi could appreciate the result of one person's imagination. It made her feel like a little bit of home in this place that was so strange. You are beginning to see him more clearly, the muse says to the girl. Sefi jumps a little bit, she is so caught off guard. You sense that the measure of your father's brother as a man falls short. You even begin to fear him. Sefi spins around. I, I didn't say... What makes you say that? I am the eyes. I can't help but see secrets. Ask him, child. Ask him why he keeps cold, echoing memories clutched inside. Ask him why the portrait he wears looks like your mother. Now, Sefi is really thrown. My mother! I, I... I will ask him! Now! Excuse me! Thank you! Sefi runs to find her uncle. When she does, he is giving orders to another lieutenant regarding a banquet. I believe this gentleman's name is LaRosi. His niece just runs up to him, though, and without any preamble or attempted subtly, blurts out, Do you wear a portrait of my mother? Elon and the attendant are both caught off guard. He grabs the girl and shoves her into a nearby room. How dare you say such a thing? Sevi, where did you get this story? That little woman told me. She said she saw it. And it's true, isn't it? 
What does it mean? What was my mother to you? She was everything, Elon says, stalking towards her. She was just one more thing that Turo stole from me. She should have been mine. Meridian should have been mine. You should have been. And here, Sephi punches him in the chest, screaming, No! Stop it! I have nothing to do with you! Oh, no? Look at your fire, girl. We're more alike than you think. We both have the power. Elon reaches out here and grabs Sephi by the throat. Don't we? But when he grabs her, something happens. The sigil seems to activate, maybe? There's a, an exchange of energy, and Elon suddenly lets his niece go, stepping back. No, he says in horror, in confusion. But what am I doing? Sephi, please forgive me, he whispers. But the damage is done. No! We are not alike! I am nothing like you! And I will never be you! I'm not staying here! I'm going home! Crying, Sefi flees the room. Too stunned to do anything about it, Elan lets her leave. As she runs to the docks, shedding the head covering that Elan gave her, Sefi's narration kicks in again. She wasn't just leaving behind Catador when she fled. She was leaving behind the only living relative she had left. Her first true enemy. But she didn't care. She was the daughter of Meridian. And she was going home. We end issue three on an awesome hero shot of Sephi, ropes swinging around her as she pilots a ship into the golden sky. Beautiful. Just lovely work. I absolutely love the feeling of energy and kineticism here at the end of the issue. While Sephi has been a fairly physical character in the world of Meridian, she also hasn't really been asked to do a lot so far in the comic. But this shot of her, her arms thrown wide as she pulls on the ropes, and the way that they twist around her just looks so cool. There's a lot to be said for just the power of cool in a comic book. I also love that her dress has this upper portion to it that looks a little bit like a vest. It immediately brought to mind the image that I have in my head of a pirate with their vest on, which obviously I associate with sailing a ship and fighting against authority figures, which Sefi is now heading down that road. Plus, she is flying off into a sky that is all warm yellows, oranges, and peach colors. Sefi is fleeing the darkness of Catador and her uncle, and things are looking brighter already. So all of that works really well. But we also have quite a bit of drama that led to this moment, right? First off, we have the first meeting between Sefi and the Muse of Gaiatan. Now, at this point in CrossGen's history, the Muse had really thrown us fans for a bit of a loop. It sure seemed that every sigil bearer had a mentor figure that was assigned to them. This figure always had orange eyes that sometimes glowed, uh, and they often spoke in vague hints with instructions or riddles. The Muse obviously fits that bell incredibly well, but she has also largely been Elon's mentor so far. If each sigil bearer is supposed to get a mentor, then where was Sefi's? Is it one mentor for Elon and Sefi, or are they going to get one each? And what does that mean for the rest of the patterns that we had been seeing in the broader and cross-gen universe? Well, as we see here, the Muse isn't contracted to be Elon's ally at all. She is the one who spurred Sefi to action. She wanted Sefi to confront Elon, although what she wanted that outcome to be, we have no idea. Secondly, ooh, that confrontation, y'all. Hmm. Ah, Elon loved Sefi's mom, and he blames Turos for stealing her, for stealing Meridian away from him. That is some spicy floopin' tea right there. And no wonder Elon is so fixated on the island and its ownership, he thinks it should have been his long ago. I would say that he's obviously wrong about that, but still, that's what he thinks, that's what he believes, and it is from that belief that he has been driven so far. I do think it's particularly interesting that he kinda sorta halfway claims Sefi as his own here, saying that she should have been his too. This kind of retroactively explains why he's gone to the trouble of sparing her, of bringing her to his island, of taking steps to protect her and begin training her. Because, thinking about it, 
Wouldn't it have made more sense for Alon to have killed Sefi in the house fire in the same way that Turos died? No one would have stood in his way of claiming Meridian legally then, right? Elon doesn't love Sefi as a family member, but he does treasure her as the last remaining part of her mother, who he did love, and so he decided that he would keep her. This also explains Elon's comment in Cross-Gen Chronicles when he gave Sefi that head covering, commenting that it's the sort of thing her mother would have worn. He knows what her mother would have worn, because he had been lusting over her. It also recontextualizes Taros's death a little bit, because it wasn't just a practicality for Elon, paving the way for him to take control of Meridian. It was also a little bit of payback for stealing the woman that he loved. Elon isn't just a selfish man, he is a sad man. And while that does not excuse his actions, it does make me sympathize with him a little bit more, which I do think makes him a good, complicated, layered bad guy. Bad guys don't have to be good people to be interesting and complicated and layered. They just need to have something that makes you go, oh, yeah. And now I have a little bit of that with Elon. And when Elon does that, when he says that Meridian should have been his, we get a close-up of Sefi's face as she steals herself against him, right? And we look into her eyes, her black pupil is shaped like Meridian. At the core of Sefi's personhood, because the eyes being the window to the soul and all that, is Meridian. Elon wants it enough to kill his brother, kidnap his niece, and invade it. And Sefi loves it enough to protect it as it is, so badly that she's going to turn her back on the only family member that she has left. We also have an interesting interaction between the two characters' sigils here, stepping aside from the emotional stuff. When Elan grabs Sefi by the throat, it is kept intentionally vague here, but something clearly happens. We can see Elan's throat and Sefi's forehead sigils glow, but their energies, like, seem to reach out across the room to the other person. We even have a really neat coloring effect behind them that matches the sigil, red and yellow, but like I said, mixing and bleeding together. When Alon grabbed her, was he actually trying to destroy Sefi in his rage? And if so, then maybe Sefi's sigil protected her from his touch. And if that's the case, maybe her more, like, restorative powers healed Elan's broken heart? Because he seems genuinely remorseful once he lets her go, and he seems equally confused by this reaction. To me, reading this, this doesn't seem like he overstepped and he's realizing he overstepped. This feels like he's doing something terrible, and for the first time in a long time, he knows that he's doing something terrible that he shouldn't be doing. Did Sefi's sigil restore Elan to someone that he used to be? Or did he just realize that he was harming the last part of her mother, destroying what small legacy she left behind? The sigil remains as mysterious for us as it does for Elan and Sefi, so right now the possibilities are endless. Who knows what happened here? And that's part of the fun of this comic for me. It's part of the fun of cross-gen for me. Next week... And, yeah, sorry, no two issues per episode quite yet. I had intended for this to be that way. I had wrote the entire script that way and everything. But by the time I finished recording everything for issue three, I could see that I'm at about the 45-minute mark, which is a bit long for a breakdown episode, and that means we're probably going to be well over an hour if I did both of the issues in one episode. So I'm pulling out the old break-it-in-two method. So next week, instead, Sefi has had enough of her uncle, clearly, and tries to return home. But Elan won't let her out of his reach so easily. So join me in a week for Comic Book Breakdown, episode 32.5 of Meridian, The Death Die. If you enjoyed this episode of Breakdown, please make sure to hit that like button. And if you are not subscribed to the show, then click on that as well. I love getting feedback, and I would really appreciate it if you did so. 
If you have any questions, concerns, or would like to suggest a comic or a series to me, Breakdown can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and on a variety of podcast platforms with links in the description for this episode below, as well as the email cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>